um, we chatted about kind of validation and, um, you know, what different frameworks, how do you measure, measure success of different funnels as you're looking through uh, your efforts. Excited to hear. Yeah, I want you to speak again. I brought you up. So you should, you should be able to speak. And you should be able to, um, yeah, allowed to talk. Hi. So have, you, have you been since, I think it's been, yeah, three or four weeks since, uh, since we chatted last. How have things been going? Yeah. So I'm still working on the project from the nonprofit. And the reason why I'm actually here today is how do you deal as a designer and also as a volunteer in a, you know, a situation like this? So just going to uh, bring a little bit of what's going on. Uh, they are not exactly on the map yet. And we are two teams. We have the marketing teams as, you know, the volunteers, and we also have the design team. And this week they were actually approached by a company that wants to sort of like outsource their service to collect the recycled oil. Uh, it's a sustainable nonprofit and they work uh, pretty much gathering uh, used oil, like fried oil and they were approached and they in the guys actually the the nonprofit uh, re responsible is actually asking for help in terms of the business model and things like that. I'm like, mm, I think this is a little bit outside our scope. So how do you deal with that? You know, uh, I know it's a tricky situation because it's a volunteering uh, scenario. So I, I would assume you ended up doing more, right? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, I think you know, um, kind of a, we could take it two ways to approach it. I think the first way is, you know, the volunteer scenario that you're in. Um, it sounds like, yeah, the needs have changed. And, you know, as you offer services, this is definitely more on like, you know, freelance agency type type style, not ne necessarily product. But um, since you offer different services, um, one thing that we like to do is approach them with more of an open statement of work and an open scope to allow you to change to new information. And I think, you know, as you look at your career as a designer, um, you're gonna continue to see those opportunities to get, get brought into the business world um, and more into the business model, into product strategy. And so how we approach it though is, is like that, where um, we might have um, a designer who's kind of bridging the gap between the business model and also design process. Um, and that includes like business model canvas, those sort of things. But how we typically build the teams would be having a specific product strategist that would then focus on the business model, focus on the business risks, um, understanding what metrics you have, the forecast of the, the business model, um, how does it scale, how do you acquire customers, all of those things that, you know, in your case, you're talking about are outside of the software, but that's often the most important part, you know, as you think about building a business, whether that's digital or not, is making sure you have a sound business model, you have the pricing figured out, you you understand what value you're providing in the context of the market. And so I think in a lot of those cases, it's, um, you know, maybe for you, you, you might not feel like you have experience enough to to do that, or um, or maybe you do. I, I think, uh, you know, where we, we often default to is true agile, which means like we're, we're open to new information and new needs as it comes up, not necessarily just a way of doing scrum, but a way of adapting to new information and needs based on the needs of the business. So a lot of our engagements are very flexible to help account for that. But I know that not one person can do all those things in all cases. Yeah. So. When you say that, uh, it sound uh, we have to have the business model sound and the value proposition as well. Um, we 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 should be doing a workshop then with then again to do that to recreate that as the situation changes. I do apologize. I know that my speakers were uh, were on <laughs> fixed now. Um, is this something that it is part of the design scope? This is something that, I, you know, this is more product design and it's not so much UX, right? So that's the thing that I'm getting a, a little bit confused. Yeah, I mean, they definitely can be considered the same. I think it depends on your experience and expertise. For us, for example, our designers for a long time would handle this. You know, we'd have a senior product designer on our end who would do more of the, um, the business uh, modeling, the validation, the 
price testing, customer interviews, all of that, and then also go and move into, you know, that UX UI, more of that on the glass type experience. So I think it depends on your skill set and what you're comfortable with. Um, but in a lot of cases, as you think about building a business, that is a key part of it. You know, we call it business and product strategy, but you could, you could still have the same person um, facilitate that depending on, on the skill set. But yeah, usually would, would materialize itself in the form of a, an initial workshop to unpack all those assumptions around who the customer is, what problem are we trying to solve, and what are the different substitutes in the market, and then go have interviews and, and have those conversations with customers to really uncover and figure out, is this something that they want? And um, I think last time we talked a little bit about trying to bridge the gap and measure on prototypes and measure on different things. That the same is true for the business offering. If you could come up with, with some sort of uh, offer that you could present to those customers you're talking to, you can actually test if they would buy it, um, you know, whether that was the recycled oil or uh, whatever it might be you can actually try and get a commitment from that customer as a way to essentially vote that you're on the right track. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Thais. Any, anything else that you're wondering as we, as we kind of unpack that a little bit? Um, am I alone? Am I here just by myself? Well, there's anyone no, else. Um, yeah, we have <laughs> just, a couple other people here as okay. well, but just wanted to make sure you felt like you were, uh, you got what you needed for now. I think so, Andrew. Um, I'm just gonna go through here my 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 online stuff here that I have. I have some notes here, and if something came up, I will definitely come back. Don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and next up we have uh, Mike Mataloni. I'll I'll allow you to talk here. Mike, I know you sent me a message, uh, an email actually prior to this, so. I was digging into that a little bit again, but for, for those listening um, and those kind of tuning in, could you unpack a little bit and maybe just give a quick, you know, as, as complex as it is, give a kind of a background on what, what problem uh, you're currently facing and things that you've tried and kind of what, what your decisions you're facing coming up. Certainly. Well, first, uh, good morning, uh, Andrew and Jacob and everyone else on the call here. Um, I, uh, I wasn't sure if this was an appropriate topic since it's, uh, it was rather weighty and several paragraphs that I sent over to you. Um, but I figured I'd give it a shot since it's the first time I've been on this, uh, on this session. So I appreciate uh, you know, uh, getting a separate, you know, another, other sets of eyes and ears and thoughts uh, on this. So I work for, um, I'm not in a startup. I work for a nonprofit organization, a membership organization uh, that's a rather old and established uh, organization and uh, the program that I support is a website platform. We have 133 websites on the platform and we, um, uh, you know, it's been a, a sort of an operations mode for about the last five years. Uh, we still have continued interest in it, but we've had, um, we've sort of been languishing with the, I manage the technical side of it. We work with a third party that does the hosting and the development work. I've been a developer most all my career, but haven't been as much hands-on the last mm, decade or so, but I still can, I, I'm doing most of the troubleshooting for them as far as where to look for things. Um, and we're sort of, I wouldn't say we're at a crossroads, but we're at a point where um, just, tr you know, some, one of the biggest things we have is where we just did an upgrade and we're just languishing and fall out from that. A lot of issues that, and new features and things that were never considered by, our vendor on that. We're also faced with, um, you know, growth that we, you know, and continued interest in this. Um, we're looking to move to Azure hosting um, and away from this current vendor. But in order to do so, we're going to have to take on, you know, one of the things we're going to have to take on is DNS management, um, which is something that uh, traditionally we hadn't done. And if we're going to take that on, um, being a 162 year old organization, we have a whole floor of lawyers and they usually get involved in those things as well. So, um, you know, when I had my own business and worked with startups, um, you know, a lot of these things would have probably already been taken care of by now. And now I'm sort of at a point where, um, you know, there's a realization these things need to happen, but things just don't happen. So, um, 
you know, that, and we're all, then I'm also, but I'm also kind of taking it to a bigger picture because we're having a strategy session next week. Uh, people want to talk about some more focused areas. I'm looking at, you know, let's, let's just reaffirm, you know, the goal and the mission of this and what, what has changed. Obviously our organization, like everyone else has been impacted by COVID and, um, you know, there were changes as a result of that, you know, does the, you know, does the mission and vision still, va is it still valid or does it need to be readdressed? And then, you know, let's look longer term with this. If this is something we're going to continue with, are we working with the right technology? Are we working with the right structure of this? Um, you know, so those are some of the things that I'm, uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, substance there and it's, I'm not expecting uh, miracles, but just to, um, you know, just to have some discussion and uh, to sit around a table and talk about this a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Mick. I, I think I caught most of that and was referencing some of your notes also that you sent over. Um, yeah, I think you mentioned it, but coming back to what the what the goal is, right? What's the what's the goal of this next step? And how will the organization know if it's moving towards that goal, right? How does it know? Does it know if it's moving the needle? And then I think, you know, to your point, there are some compliance things that you mentioned with legal in, you know, managing DNS and other things um, as you scale. You know, are there more creative ways to try and handle that, you know, white label scenario um, that you're kind of kind of talking about? Is there is there a multi-tenant aspect to the technology that you have and you're supporting um, that you could present that would kind of help you become more scalable in the future and detach a little bit from those legal concerns and kind of the red tape and and really the process, you know, so you can cut down the time to launch for a new customer rather than trying to go through um you know, being hung up in legal as we've mm -hmm. all been a part of that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So can you help me understand a little bit more about your, um, about the CMS platform? So you, you upgraded it, you know, you upgraded it and now you're planning to essentially onboard additional clients. I mean, how are you thinking about success of this platform? Um, you know, you mentioned there was a redesign, a de design refresh that you were doing, but, um, and, a, and a hefty backlog of different things. Are you, how are you thinking about growth, you know, based on where you are and, you know, what does the next one to three years look like gr growth wise? Is that new websites? Is that, is that less support? Is that more self-service? Is that um, additional revenue? Yeah, and I think that's where it also goes into the the, the vision for this because I think there's right now the way we're structured is I co-manage this with our, our marketing department. Yep. So there's a marketing manager. I handle more of the technical side. She handles more of the the marketing the content. Um, we have an ad program that's integrated with this as well. Um, you know, there's a desire to you know there's a desire to I mean what if the look I mean there's obvious we have a potential if we were to offer this platform, uh, a website to every affiliated society w of the organization, we'd have about 500 websites. Um, you know, the question is, should we have those anyway, um, you know, and, you know, have almost as a stub site? Um, you know, so these are some of the things that I have in the back of my mind as someone who had thought of this idea with another organization I was with about 20 years ago, uh, they didn't want to buy into it. And then I ended up getting this job uh, many years later. I said, oh, yeah, this makes complete sense. I thought of this years ago. Um, I think there's, you know, there's there's the growth and adoption of the, of the technology. I think what we've seen through through COVID is that there was information that we needed to share that we were able to do. And I think there's a lot more that we could do with that. Um, because it's a, a membership organization, there's some, uh, some of our site owners are, you know, our marketing people that, you know, that that's their full-time job. And in other cases, it's a volunteer who is actually a member who's doing it. So we have a wide range of types of users. So even the, the, the level of service or level of offerings, or maybe even some self-service where we're providing most of the content of their site uh, is something, you know, is something that could be within our range. Um, our, the look and feel of the site is very dated and, um, you know, it, it could use, it still needs to be, um, you know, the design needs to be refreshed, but also too, we, our foundation is still shaky. I think we're still, like I said, we have fallout from our upgrade. The reason why we upgraded, we actually upgraded four versions. Um, and that's because our current vendor wasn't able to upgrade it. Uh, in the past. I mean, literally we had upgrades and they failed. Mm -hmm. um, so trying to get a, a firm footing in addition to having, um, you know, to 
uh, solidify our, our, our operations, CICD, and get, you know, then to build on top of that. I mean, that, that's what success is to me. So that's why we're having this session. I'm not the, you know, the, I'm not the owners of this marketing and our technology directors are, and, you know, I'm sort of the front line of this. And it, it hasn't been, we haven't, it hasn't been given that hard look in a long time. So that's where I don't yeah. know if we're going to get that from this one session next week. I don't, and but I'm also trying to understand too. Okay, what we're doing is not within a is not in a bubble. Um, right. You know, there's impacts in the rest of the organization, and, and how do those factor in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it sound you know, and, and we've done this many times for, you know, and with other companies, but it sounds like it might be good to almost in that session propose like you know cast maybe your vision a little bit and talk about like what the future could be talk about, you know, recognizing the, the problems and issues that, um, that you currently have and what's preventing you from reaching this goal of continued adoption, like improving your CICD, uh, maybe creating like a design system um, that all of your platforms use, even though they're going to be white labeled and hosted on different, um, you know, DNS, things like that. And maybe, maybe this is where you could propose like a Google ventures type design sprint um, where you'd get that cross-functional team. You'd get all the stakeholders in there and run like a one week, maybe even um, two ones back to back and just say, Hey, let's take a pause back and let's explore, you know, is this worth investing in going down these other routes? So doing a little bit of discovery and research and then trying to uh, come up with ideas on how you might improve, you know, the UI, uh, the service design really aspect of that. Hey, when somebody signs up brand new, if you were to scale from, I think it was 133 websites on the platform, you said to 500, like how could you make that smooth and how could you make that, um, you know, not something that would grind the whole org to a halt by, you know, essentially three to four Xing, you know, the number of sites you're, you're promoting. Yeah. So I think like, you know, maybe laying a, laying a seed might be the best thing, you know, to, to start to get alignment and, and talk about, Hey, I've, I've recognized these things kind of in these areas from my viewpoint. Um, what do you, what are you guys feeling? You know, what is, what is tech feeling and what are their concerns and what is marketing feeling and what are their concerns? And then maybe there's some common ground where all three of your efforts could, could align. That, uh, that sounds, that sounds like a plan. That's what I'm, I'm starting to flush out some, you know, from you know based on kind of what i this was what i sent to you was actually the first time i kind of put down all of this sort of like our our top line um position where we are and i've started making some notes about how you know what what are some topics to bring up next week in that meeting so um yeah that's uh, uh thanks for validating that and you know just you know your experience with it too is is helpful here because it's it's one of those, and that's that's where I was I was thrilled to be on this, just to just to be able to put this out there and talk about this with others outside the, the organization. So yeah, yeah, I, I dropped a link into the design sprints page, and and this isn't something we created. If you're familiar with Google Ventures, like they designed it for their portfolio companies to try and learn fast, but for okay. big for big old companies um, that are kind of you know dated, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and maybe their approach and also some of the processes. It's a good opportunity to get alignment in a short period of time. So rather than, you know, you going back and forth over a series of months or quarters or even years, right, as you think about um, moving this, the, uh, moving your efforts forward, could you time box that to one or two weeks where you can make a ton of progress, get more clarity together, and really elevate the understanding of all the stakeholders that are involved between, you know, you, marketing, tech, uh, potentially your, your design or dev partner as well, on where you're trying to go in the future Okay, great. And, and oftentimes it'll, it'll help to, you know, I think there's, uh, Jacob and I were talking about this the other day, uh, or earlier today, like there's things that you know that the team doesn't know or understand. And I think creating that common understanding together by taking, you know, a series of days or weeks together to build that will help kind of reinvigorate and get everyone on the same page with what, hey, what are the possibilities? Like, what could we do together um, versus kind of Mike just driving it and it being Mike's idea, everyone can kind of throw in and be able <laughs> yeah. to, to build upon that together. Great. Okay. Awesome. Well, yeah. And, and, yeah. And if you're looking for more, there's, um, I'll try to look up uh, and drop a couple links in here for Google Venture Design Sprints. I mean, you can also Google it. There's a lot of, a lot of good case studies on how people have used it to learn and, um, and really time box learning and, and 
almost getting folks on the same page and, and helping to facilitate those decisions. So. Okay. Great. I appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. All right. And we'll, we'll bring um, Albert up here to talk. Hi, Albert. Hey, Albert, can you, can you hear us? You should be able to unmute and ask Hello. questions. Oh, hit. I can Hi. hear you. Yeah. Um, so um, my name is Albert. Um, so I actually got an invite from uh, a YouTube channel. Um, I'm a developer myself, and um, I'm so much interested in the content that you guys offer. I think I discovered your channel headway um, somewhere in last December, and I enjoy most of all the content over there. So I kind of like just joined the link to learn more and all of that. So I'm a developer here based in uh, Ghana in Africa here, and I'm just here to learn more. So yeah, I don't really have any questions uh, for today. Yeah, no worries. I appreciate the support and, you know, our, our team loves putting these events on and, and chatting with designers, developers, founders from everywhere to figure mm -hmm. out, you know, how can we share what we know and learn what we don't together. So I appreciate you. Do you want to talk a little bit about what, what you're working on from a development side? Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm a front end developer. I work heavily with um, React um, uh, library and a bit of TypeScript as well. So Currently, um, I'm working on a freelance. I, I work uh, full time at a company, um, and then I'm also working on a freelance project. So currently, I'm, I had a project that I was supposed to work on, and so I last week that was on Sunday. I decided to kind of like do the design system. So um, I've done the design system and everything. It's just um, a little project that I'm doing. So I heavily I use uh, SAR component a lot to do my uh, design systems. And uh, one of the things that I've discovered on the internet was, um, I mean, I discovered was uh, the patterns of architecting your front-end application. And I chanced upon Brad Frost's atomic design. So I have kind of like tried to model my front-end application based on atomic design principle, not like religiously. And also, um, using storybooks as well to kind of like uh, document my design uh, systems and that I'll need my app. So that is what I've been up to and at the moment and so far it's it's been great. Yeah, I'm still learning and yeah. Always learning. Yeah, that's good. I mean, definitely things that we, you know, that we believe in and hold close to our product teams too is atomic design and using, you know, I, I think there's, we have some videos on the channel of using Storybook and Figma together and how our design yeah, yeah. teams do that. Yeah, I, so. I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. I think I, I jump on one of the, I think the videos we posted on YouTube, I think on the Figma as well. So my skills in Figma is kind of like not too good, but chancing upon a video, I just kind of like, your workshop are like, I would say it's, 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 it's been a blessing. I discovered your channel last year. It's been so, so, so much blessing. I learned so much that um, also some of the tutorials or courses that are out there, the paid ones, as a matter of fact, you know, up to the standard that Headway is providing this content. So yeah, I appreciate everything that you guys are doing for the community. So yeah. Yeah, thanks, Albert. It cut out for a little bit for me, but I got the gist of that. Um, I appreciate that. You know, definitely part of our goal is to, we all learned the same way through other people sharing. So we're trying to do the same. So yeah, that means right, a lot. Cool. We'll pass that all on right. to the team for sure. Sure. Yeah, yeah thanks sure. again and, and good luck, Albert. And let us know, Thank reach you. out if you have any other questions or any uh, thing that you're struggling with in React, event ideas, things like that. We can pass those to the team as well. Jacob, who's on, on this call, um, helps to coordinate all of our events and our, our channel and all that stuff. So feel free sure. to drop drop him a line as well. All right. So I, I think, uh, may I have kind of like maybe a Twitter handle or something so I could just follow yeah. you guys. I think I follow Headway on Twitter, I think. That's, yeah. Yeah, there's our, our um, handles for Headway, oh, okay. myself, and, and Jacob. All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks, Albert. I appreciate it. Thank you, too. Thank good you. luck. Thank you. All right. So that, um, Jacob, that's 
all we have in the waiting room right now are um, folks kind of lined up. So um, you kind of see if anyone else has any any questions here. I'm going to check on. Oh, it looks like somebody just hopped in on YouTube. Yeah, it looks like Jason's. Uh, Jason, you just hopped in and, and you're up. You're in the you're in the hot seat. So I'll allow you to talk here in a moment. And then if you could just introduce yourself, what you're working on, um, and uh, what what you're struggling with, we can chat through it. Hi, Andrew. Thank you for uh, letting me in. Um, my name is Jason Windsor. I'm actually a uh, marketing and support director for a, another Wisconsin software company called Retail Toolkit. And uh, I have been sort of tasked with um, aiding in product development, uh, product strategy rather. Um, and, and even because I have some design background, helping with some of that too, doing mock-ups for the developers. Um, and a, a lot of, uh, maybe to wrap up the hundreds of questions I have into one, um, would be, you know, what's a great way to get started doing this kind of strategy work, um, especially coming from the marketing background, you know, my that the marketing background, I think, has helped me see um, product from a uh, user story perspective. You know, we're, we're sort of doing our version of agile development, which means I'm, I'm creating a lot of stories and, and, and trying to build use cases for features and, and net new product where our, our platform is or our application is more developed, more mature than um, maybe some of the others that um, you're looking to speak with today, but um, it, given the new role and responsibilities that I've been tasked with, I'd, I'd love some insight into a great way to sort of kickstart this, um, this part of my career. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, great question, Jason. Um, and familiar with, with Dan over at Retail Toolkit, him and I spoke maybe a year or so ago. So yeah, you mentioned uh, you guys. I, um, and I, I sort of, tangentially know Clint um, over at Headway too. So yeah, um, we, we've we've discussed Headway before internally here. So, uh, but yeah, um, and I'm actually yeah. on the East Coast, but uh, yeah, we're the company's based in uh, Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, I, I guess a few things. So like, as you think about product strategy and this would be good for you coming from the marketing world, like one research method we use a lot that's commonly kind of started in marketing was is jobs to be done. And that's really like uncovering the, I mean, that's if you didn't have a product already, I'm familiar with with Retail Toolkit and, and what you do. So, um, but still like doing some sorts of those interviews um, can help you find new opportunities in your product already. You know, so trying to understand a little bit more about um, how your customers are using it now, why maybe for the retailers that you have, like what other tools are they using? Um, what other motivations do they have and, and things like that. And from my, my conversations with Dan, it sounds like your metrics are, are kind of industry leading as far as the metrics you can attribute to, to purchases and things like that. Um, but so one is, you know, finding new opportunities, looking to things like jobs to be done, um, to be able to do interviews and pull out those insights to understand maybe why someone started with Retail Toolkit and what were the motivating factors for them to move away, right? What drove those purchasing and adoption decisions? Um, the other side of, of kind of product strategy is, hey, now that you have opportunities, which ones are the right ones for us? So a lot of times for us on product strategy, we'll combine that with design or, or dev to try and sell new enterprise um, software before we go build it to try and understand more about uh, the mindset of how people think the buying cycle why why maybe they they don't perceive enough value in the solution we created to then present those things to them yeah and maybe and I've, I've heard ahead. of the jobs to be done um, evaluation as sort of a replacement for personas especially from a product standpoint you know marketing might still use something like personas but jobs to be done being a more useful way to uh, strategize the product itself. Yeah, and it's all about that the, the journey of your customer, that arc, right? It's kind of a, a storyline, what led them to, to make this change um, and what led them to actually adopt Retail Toolkit or even something super valuable is like, what, what caused your customers to churn? Sure. Why did they leave, right? Why did they move to a different customer? And just scheduling a call with somebody to figure out, you know, what motivated them? What, what kind of pulled them to it? Why, why didn't they see... Um, 
the value in kind of what you're doing. So the other side of it that's that's much more tactical um, from product strategy standpoint is we use the pirate model a lot inside of our um, inside of our products. And so really getting the instrumentation where you can track user adoption and the pirate model is called the pirate model. It's by um, Derek Sivers um, of 500 startups, but essentially it is um, awareness is the first one. You know, do you have brand recognition? Um, acquisition, can you acquire someone's interest? That's like webinar signups. If you have demos, signing up um, newsletters, those sort of things. Once you, once you acquire them, you almost think of it like a funnel. Um, once you acquire them, can you activate their account, right? Can you, can you cause them in, uh, cause them to, to join and to start and with enterprise software, the beautiful thing is that revenue is usually tied up front. Let me, let me see if I can pull, I did a talk on this, um, recently, but let me see if I can pull this up to be able to kind of, to give you a better visual of, um, what we're talking through. And while you're doing that, Jacob, thank you for the link. Um, uh, your your uh, invitation on Twitter is how I got here. So thank you for that. Awesome. Good to hear. So can you see my screen here? Yep. So the whole the whole idea is here to think think like a pirate. And it's three A's and, and three R's. Um, and I said Derek Sivers is Dave McClure, sorry. <laughs> um, but so for uh, for this funnel, it's really like awareness. Is your brand recognizable with your target audience? This is like if you went up to retailers, you know, and I know you're, you're big into the cycling world, um, but I don't know if you're exclusively in that. So could you go up to retailers and would they know kind of who you were by name? Um, that's, that's definitely more of a branding and a scaling um, type thing as you get market adoption and, and kind of penetration. Uh, but acquisition, so obtaining new customers that sign up, activation, once attained, they actually create an account, they add their content, they set up, in your case, their um, you know, hardware devices that will start to track the information, the retention, you know, how, how often are they coming back, what are they using it for, um, what's your overall customer lifetime value. Are your customers referring customers for you? So if someone owns multiple stores, are they installing it across all their stores or just one? Are they recommending you to other people in their network? And then revenue, are, are people paying? And one thing I mentioned before is this revenue. You know, you, a lot of times you have, you acquire someone's attention and then there's a sales event, you know, where you can get some revenue, whether that's a paid pilot or, you know, actually just coming in, you know, whole hog and, and purchasing the software. But then you get to the activation and kind of get the customer success standpoint. So as we think about product strategy, there's a whole approach called um, Lean UX that, that really leans upon this model, where as you think about, you know, iterating retail toolkits offering, you essentially would take a look and, and visualize this funnel. And these would have percentages and, you know, hard numbers attached to them excuse me, um, hard numbers attached to them where you'd be able to say, um, what are the primary one, maybe two metrics that we want to impact this month through experimentation that can guide our design and development process? And um, I'll just pull up and do a little sketch here. You know, that can guide our, our process. Um, because a lot of times from a product strategy standpoint, as you're, you're likely seeing this, there's different stakeholders, everyone wants something else. You have the pull of clients and, and what they want, you know, um, that could be from sales, that could be from, um, you know, existing clients, you have all of this feedback. And so when you pick a metric, I'll just uh, do this really quick here. If you were to pick a metric, um, the whole Lean UX model is based on this. Let's say you want to do improve retention and actually the, uh, be able to promote the value that somebody was getting. So you would pick retention and then you kind of go through this process and say, okay, if this is our metric of all the people we serve, who, who do we want to impact that metric for? So you can get more specific. So this could be, in your case, this could be managers. This could be you know, a store, end user, manager, inventory, stockist. I mean, I'm not super familiar with all the all the stakeholders sure. you have, um, but just an example. And this, you know, maybe this is the executive, the, you know, the owner, not the manager. So you would kind of pick and say, hey, we want to increase retention for, say, the person who's responsible to work with us. 
So one would be picking a metric, two would be saying who is our user, and then three would be um, saying what value would we need to provide for that to be true. So let's say this metric, uh, let's quantify this metric real quick. Let's say they're coming back every five days into the platform. And you think like maybe they should be watching the metrics more and this is these are total assumptions around your business model. So let's say average user comes back every five days. Let's say we want them to, to make this an every two day thing. So what you would do is say for this user to come back every, every two days, what value would we need to provide them for that to be true? And what this does is really helps you keep customer centric and helps you start to uncover, like, do we even know what, what they would value? And oftentimes before you go to the next step, this is where you're having kind of those conversations with users um, where you're interviewing them, you're understanding maybe what value they're getting now. Hey, why don't you use it more often? Like what features are you finding helpful? And you can combine this with like your platform metrics. So if you have amplitude or intercom or event tracking, you can kind of see what's adding up to that. Um, but then you'll, you'll start to figure out like, do we think we can actually make them use the platform more? And, and the underlying assumption here is that if they can use it more, they might realize more value from the platform. They might understand that the value you provide is, is more than maybe what they thought uh, by getting more in-depth analytics or, uh, or what have you. But so once you get through this and you, you feel like you have a, a solid understanding of the value you'd need to provide for that to be true, uh, you would move in kind of this fourth phase, which would be, okay, what are the, um, what are the features that are actually going to get us there? And so you're creating feature ideas and ideation with your team, oftentimes with design and development um, to create these features ideas, say, Hey, we have this, this kind of marching goal that we want to get to. We know it's for this user. Here's the value we think they need to get. How would we, you know, what, what might that look like in features? Is that additional push notifications? Is that better visibility for them on reporting and day-to-day -day metrics? And then once you get through that, you come up with a bunch of ideas. So like, hey, we, we might have all these, all these different ideas that, that could get us there. But then you have now a prioritization exercise that you can get to. So, um, but before you go to the, the prioritization, you have a hypothesis. So all of these things individually might not get you to that two day retention. So you might say like, hey, we could implement, um, we could implement push notifications that would do this. We could do a weekly report that would kind of fill in the gaps for um, this other thing we could do, you know, other specific things, but essentially you would say like, you'd craft, craft a response that would say, we believe that for this user, which is the one we, um, the one we outlined here to get this value, doing this feature would get us um, X percent on our way to our goal. And so it's a way to try and objectify the, the percent change that your features are gonna have on a specific behavior. And then you would essentially do, um, pick your, your best hypothesis um, based on what you know. And these are guesses, right? But this is, uh, these are informed guesses. And what you would do then is um, start to, to plot them on value versus effort mm -hmm. on just like a common one by one. So then you can start to understand, um, and when when you when you estimate these, um, you're going to want like total, you know, what's the actual business cost? So that includes, you know, um, additional discovery that you might need. Um, that would include design. Sorry for the <laughs> paraphrasing here. Um, dev, QA, deployment. Right. And so you have like this packet of value that you're saying you can provide to this user, but you really have all of these inputs as you consider the amount of effort it's going to take. So if you can um, essentially, once you get these, you plot that uh, and estimate them, you'll plot them on this list and say, hey, like, we're going to start here, like highest value, lowest effort first. 
And so then you can start to think through how you move the needle faster for your customers with less effort. And so this Lean UX framework helps you to do that and is a very tactical way for you to take a business facing metric in one of these pirate metrics and then be able to bring that forward and do this exercise with your team. And since it's objectified, what we found is a lot of times that your, your team will get better buy-in and your ideas now become their ideas because you're, you're focusing on what the, what the value is to the customer and not like who had this feature idea, right? It becomes much more object, objective and you can all start to take ownership of that together. So kind of a lot. Um, no, it's awesome. And what, uh, yeah. also being uh, having a hand in our customer success department gives me kind of a more on the ground view of, of what the customers are, what's their biggest pain point in the application or in their jobs. And uh, no, this is really helpful. Um, feel free to send me an invoice for uh, <laughs> the work you just did. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what we're here for. And I mean, there's a book called Lean UX that, that outlines a lot of this process and things that we, we believe in, like how do you objectify design decisions and, and product decisions? And part of that is one, what's a metric? And two, like, let's, let's actually talk to customers and, and uncover uh, where our opportunities are and combine kind of that qualitative and quantitative viewpoint into it. But yeah, hopefully that was helpful. Any, any other questions you have kind of on the back of this? Um, yeah, you know, mostly sort of abstractly taking the time to do those things can be tough when you're kind of in, uh, in, in midstream in, uh, developing your product and, and trying to do bug fixing. And, and that, that's the thing that I'm learning most is, is really, um, compartmentalizing the time to do that kind of evaluation. And maybe yeah. that's during a planning sprint or uh, an all hand, not for us, all hands is not the people, but, you know, um, team meeting, something like that, that we can prioritize. Um, and um, then just trying to, yeah, I think the high value, low effort um, is sort of a great place to start. And um we, we've done ice scoring in the past and other kinds of prioritization exercises. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it just as everything else does comes down to resources and time and, um, yeah. and, uh, but I, I think that's, um, that's a model that we hadn't yet used. We probably used every other one so far. <laughs> um, but, uh, that's one that, that seems, um, maybe simpler and, and would require less time to run new, new possible features through the analysis. Um, yeah. And, and so trying, but trying to, like you said, be really objective about it rather than me being on the success side, hearing the loudest voices, you know, and mm -hmm. we, we have people who have a, a really complex effort, heavy feature, but only one of them in our entire customer base wants it. And so making sure that um, rather than just greasing the squeakiest wheel that we prioritize um, well, uh, especially given how limited our resources are, but um, that was really yeah. helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, as you're a smaller team, it could make, make sense to do like a, you know, maybe you do a planning day once a month. Hey, we're going to take a step back knowing that you have, you know, being a, a small startup or you mentioned a small team, like there's a lot that you could be doing, right? And there's always things screaming, oh, yeah. there's bugs, there's support mm -hmm. requests, there's, you know, additional sales, all the things. So maybe even just taking a half day a month or something, or even, you know, depending on the velocity of your team, maybe it is a quarterly thing where you could, hey, we're sustaining the business, our existing customers, we're making, you know, some slight iterations on, on requests that come in. But then maybe you take that pause once a quarter to, to really base that with the team and say, hey, here's where, here's our metrics over the last quarter. Here's um, what our business goals are. And here's how kind of the product can help us serve that. Here's our problem statement. And, you know, the, the example of that is the problem statement um, would be that retention goal. Hey, we're trying to increase retention because we believe that that'll lead to additional revenue and longer customer lifetime value by focusing on promoting more of the value we do provide. Yeah, and that that revenue step might include um, add-on uh, features that are paid, or 
I'm just clarifying for myself. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, or additional. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, the other thing that we use that we use with this is we have a book about it, like knowing what features to build first. We have a, uh, an ebook about it. But um, essentially, like once you have those individual cards, let's say, hey, we, we want to implement social sign on or want to implement like a new sign on method. Sure. There's probably multiple ways for you to do that. And so we use Moscow to try and peel back like what's essential to get somebody, I mean, that that's a poor example of, of right. a mature, of a mature product, but let's say like, Hey, we wanted to report on these new metrics. What's the easiest thing for us to do? Well, let's just show a number, right? Let's just show a number on the dashboard. And then the next step from that is like, well, let's show this graph and the next evolution of that. That's probably a nice to have is like this interactive graph that helps you change the dates that helps you, you know, maybe print to a, a, you know, some sort of image that you can share with your team or automate an email that goes out, right? There's kind of an evolution of the features that one will provide the value by just showing the stat and creating awareness. The other ones are more nice to have and kind of facilitate what happens with that data later. Yeah. And the trick being don't go directly to V4. Right. <laughs> you know, exactly. You, know, you, you can, but it takes four times as long, but you know, and, and what is MVP to make, Yep. Your existing customers happy without trying to dazzle them with every new thing you deliver, but you haven't delivered the 10 things they've been wanting for six months. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Can, can you learn if they value that number versus it looking pretty, right? Sure. And most people will value the number over it look at the, the prettiness. My, I mean, you might capture a new client's attention, but um, as far as like getting the value to somebody. And, and you're right. Most of our clients are, are cycle, you know, bike shop owners, uh, bike shop retailers, and, and, Many of them just want the number. They don't need yeah. <laughs> the, you know, um, the Asana unicorn rainbow <laughs> splash across the page every time they look at something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's the, I mean, that's the challenge, right? Because I, I actually had a tweet thread about this, like thinking about as we craft product teams and like a lot of it's discipline, like, you know, as a product strategist, you think more product strategy, more interviews are going to do it as a designer. You think more designs going to do it as a developer. You think like, you know, more, uh, higher quality code, more code is going to be the answer, but really it's like the synergy of all of them together where like we agree on what's necessary and what's essential and then like can evolve it over time. Um, but it's hard as somebody who's focused on their craft of designer dev or marketing or whatever to know when enough's enough. And it's, it's not black and white for sure. Yeah. And you're also trying to stake your claim in the, in the final product of yep. value add for your role. And, and that's understandable, but the the metrics at the end are what really matters. So um, I'm happy to let uh, the next person um, pick your brain, but I really appreciate you taking the time to answer. Yeah, absolutely, Jason. Yeah, we actually, um, I think, are wrapped up unless someone else hops in. We actually have one question from YouTube. Okay, yeah, let's. Oh, he actually, now he just said he's away from the computer. Oh. <laughs> uh, what, but he just typed it. Uh, but the question, we can just, uh, answer it though. Um, the question was, uh, is testing necessary in the early stage of development? So like the product validation period. Is development testing? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, guess I was going to try to see if, um, if they wanted to um, hop on the call. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Is testing, would that be validation testing perhaps? If so, I would say yes, 100%. Like a lot of times, uh, and just to kind of fill in the gaps here, and, unless uh, Kondar, Kondarp can join us, um, you know, would recommend like trying to sell on prototypes and for enterprise customers and folks that, that we work with, we would recommend that, like trying to create a representation of the value you're gonna provide and then essentially um, be able to give them an opportunity to buy on something. So that testing that um, is so important because the last thing you want to do, and I've been a part of this in my career, is spend six months, a year, year and a half uh, building something no one wants and you don't find out until launch day. It can be much better to prototype and, and learn about customer intent and how they're thinking about your product or solution and why they trust it or why they don't and figure out if you can solve that. Because on launch day, um, you'll, you'll definitely find out what people think. And that's, you know, if you don't have any signups, if you don't have any people continuing forward or buying, like you want to try and mitigate that as much as possible.
Yeah. And, um, yeah. So sure. it looks like he's away. Um, yeah. Maybe we can. Yeah. Maybe you can just have him connect with us after and we can make sure he gets answered. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, this was a great session. I enjoyed everyone's questions. Thanks, Tyus, Albert, Mike, uh, Jason. I'm trying to think if there's anyone else. Kondarp. And, oh, looks like he might be joining now <laughs> real quick. He just said he was going to join Kondarp. Thank you, Tyus and Albert. Uh, if you want to hang around, feel free. Otherwise, um, we'll, be, we'll be wrapping up in a moment. Yeah, like I said, appreciate everyone hopping in, asking questions. Hopefully this was helpful for you all. And if you have additional questions as you move forward and you know, put some, some of the things into practice, feel free to email us at ahoy at headway.io and we'll, we'll get you the answers that you need. Kandarp, thank you for joining here. I'm gonna allow you to talk in just a moment and ask your question. Hi, Kandarp. Hey, uh, so that, that was exactly my question. Thanks very much for answering that. Yeah, I yeah. Um, was away from a uh, computer. So, sorry yeah, yeah, no, no worries. Um, anything specific about about what your what your challenge is with um, testing early on, or, or do you have a specific product that you're working on that you um, have in mind? So the way the way we're doing is uh, we're building products um, every one and a half month, and uh, just seeing if the product works, um, and you know, talking with our clients. But um, you know, we're 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 finding what products uh, work the best. And then, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're, development, if, if development's your strength, I mean, developing things is, a, is definitely a valid way of learning. You know, if you, can, if you can learn that quick and, you know, launch a product every two weeks and see who engages with it, I mean, that's, you know, there's likely considerations you're making to get there. I think it's when folks spend months and potentially years building something without getting it out there. <laughs> But it, it sounds like you're taking kind of the opposite approach where build really fast and fail fast and, and, and move on from the ideas that maybe aren't transitioning. Um, super useful. Yep. Thanks very much, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kondarp. All right. Well, well with that, we will um, we'll close up. Like I mentioned, um, hit us up, ahoy at headway.io. If you want to uh, ask your question, we'll be doing this every, every Wednesday at 11 Central. So looking forward to, to chatting more and appreciate everyone's time.